Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to These Are the Times. These Are the Times is a weekly review of contemporary affairs produced by the students and faculty of Penn State University's Capitol Campus. Your host this evening is Mark Dorfman. Tonight's guest is Zachary Swan, who was once described as the largest independent cocaine dealer in the United States. Smuggler. Smuggler. Okay, fair enough. Uh, Mr. Swan, before his career in the cocaine trade, was a packaging designer and created packages for such clients as Helena Rubenstein Cosmetics. He now resides in the Harrisburg area. His exploits as a cocaine dealer, trader, smuggler, excuse me, are chronicled in a recent Avon paperback, Snowblind, written by Robert Sabag, and soon to be a motion picture, I believe. And also soon to be followed by a sequel. Snowblinder. Snowblinder. <laughs> Mr. Swan, I think it puzzles, I know, me and perhaps many of, of your readers to come across a, a work such as Snowblind, which chronicles in great detail your activities in a career and recent enough activities that there may be, still be some legal liabilities resulting from them. Have you had any legal difficulties following the publication of the book? No, I haven't. In fact, we did leave a few clues in the book that would be possible for somebody to put something together. Uh, the reason for this is not as odd as it may seem. Uh, they would make me very wealthy if they would indict me. The whole thing, if I was pulled in, went through court and everything, before they sentenced, the whole thing would go to the probation people. And the probation people know that I haven't done a thing since 1972. Uh, the law is such that they have to find the body. And the cocaine is long gone up somebody else's nose. <laughs> right. What about IRS or other organizations? They, uh, I make monthly payments to them. They check me every year, and uh, they keep very close watch on me, oh, well, as do imagine. the local police and a lot of other people. Do you yeah. still travel internationally at all? Just a little bit, but uh, only for research purposes. Does, does this, I would assume that Customs, however, still has the welcome mat out for you. It's amazing. Uh, I think one of my greatest scams was well, the, they let me go to South America while I was on probation to do research on the book. And that's a first. Uh, I must have been very convincing one day. <laughs> and to this day, with all the publicity, the Today Show, Good Morning America, you know, and, and all the shows I've been on, I have never been searched. On the oh. tour with Avon, I went into, Bob and I went into Canada. And uh, they stopped Bob, gave him a thorough search, and they said, well, we're looking for the other guy. And they said, well, you just let him through. <laughs> well, maybe they just take you at your word. You, you, you tell them that you, in, the, in, the, in the book that you're not about to carry the stuff yourself, so maybe they <laughs> simply say, why bother? <laughs> It is a, a, a fascinating book, detailing a, a part of life that most of us first don't get to know anything about and, and certainly never see with anything near your insight. And dealing with some, some fascinating people. The tone of, of the work is that you seem to enjoy what you were doing and also to be fascinated by the different characters who you met. Is this, is this true? Yes, it is. I, I think I was making a statement, I do have a very healthy disrespect for the law. Uh, I, I, I certainly don't believe uh, that cocaine, which I smuggled, I would never smuggle anything like speed or heroin, something that, you know, is debilitating to people. Uh, and Lord knows I wouldn't s smuggle alcohol or cigarettes, you know, the real killers. <laughs> so I really don't have any... Uh, no, I, I really don't have any guilt, you know, on the subject. What about the, some of the people you met? You dealt with an awful lot of questionable characters. Did you enjoy dealing with them? Do you, did you find the, the, the contacts with such people interesting and fascinating in itself, or was it just part of your business? It was a wonderful game. To me, it was like living a movie. It was... Uh, to meet the different people, to read them. Now, I'm not a hard person. I'm not even strong physically. Uh, but I can put on a look, and I act like I'm carrying heat. And if there's a couple of men behind me, I act like they're my backup men. I just make it happen. And, of course, an awful lot of luck to pull off uh, 13 scams from South America and 
you know, not get touched. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did you have, we, you know, again, for those of us who are spectators at, at such games, uh, one of the, the rules that we read about is, is that organized crime is always moving in and, and threatening the independent practitioner. There is only one character in your, in your book that seems to have some connections or is dealt with in, in a way that seemed to imply some connections out with, with organized crime activities. Did you have any difficulties that perhaps didn't make it into print? Well, I was, I was roughed up, and they did try to move right. in. They walked in one day and said, uh, we're your partners. And I just moved again. I moved seven times in three years and changed my name again. I was Addison Brock III and Jonathan Stroll. I get off on names. <laughs> so Zachary Swan is not your original name? Or no. Uh -uh. Well, I'm not even going to ask what the, the Thank real you. one is. You probably wouldn't answer anyway. <laughs> the part of the trade that you describe, your, your smuggling activities, really seem to be an, an imaginative extension of your original pa packaging trade. That's right. The cocaine business was just like any other business. We had the buying, importing, sales, advertising. Uh, I ran it just like a regular business. Uh, I let it known I just got back from South America, so they all knew, you know, that it was fresh and good. Mm -hmm. And uh, my packages were designed especially for customs. Mm -hmm. Yet you never seem to have had any trouble. You my impression on reading the, your book was that you went to extraordinarily detailed lengths to prepare magnificently in case of trouble and then never had any difficulty at all. Well, let's see. Well, one time, you remember uh, Charles on the uh, Mexican border got caught with 200 pounds of grass. Right, and you're, you're, you had the one trip that almost... And three days later, he walked out without even having to hire a lawyer. Now, that's preparation. Right. Right. Mm. But that was the, one of the, the few incidents. You also had one mailed package, I believe. That, right. That didn't well, I sniffed it. out the... Uh, uh, you always take a blind run, even when somebody was carrying or do something. Somebody, without anything, always went through first, using the same method and everything. And if the sample run got hit, then we scratched it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, what I was leading up to, essentially, was your evaluation, if you will, of your opposition in this game. What do you think of the U.S. Customs Service? I, I really think they're turkeys. Uh, <laughs> they, they, they really can't catch anybody, but they have an impossible job. I mean, that wasn't really fair for me to say, except that I've been fighting them so long, and they've made nasty remarks about me, and they lied in court, and things like that. So I had to take a couple of shots at them. Um, the DEA brought me into uh, New York City, threatened to indict me, tried to get me to work for them. And uh, my lawyer had already tipped me off, having had friends up there in the DEA, that uh, they have nothing on you, just do what you want to do. But I went up anyway because I liked the game. And finally they did get a little rough. When I say rough, they didn't physically manhandle me, but they pushed me up against a wall with their faces up close. And they said, well, listen, if we take you down to South America, will you throw us a couple of spicks? And I said, I can't work with bigots, and left. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're, you seem almost more opposed to the drug enforcement agencies than, than to, the, to customs. Isn't I'm it? just opposed to the hypocrisy of our laws when every test here, Nixon runs a test on marijuana, spends millions of dollars, and it comes up favorable to marijuana, well, and, he throws, neutral, yeah. and throws it out the window. Mm -hmm. uh, we're making uh, criminals of our children, you know, for marijuana and cocaine. I, I, I'm not, I say speed or heroin are killers, and I would probably even turn in somebody, myself. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to see anybody hurt. But there again, that brings us right back to alcohol and cigarettes, which are state cells. And I think that's horrible. But you are a smoker. <laughs> I am a smoker, but I'm trying to stop, and I'm hooked and, addi and addicted to it. But I took pure cocaine for four years, and there was a rest that I stopped. Without no withdrawal, no pangs, no anything. And they try to tell us it's addictive. The reaction to cocaine that you describe in great detail in, in your book seems extraordinarily mild. Uh, 
Yet the drug itself is, is of course, extremely expensive, a high-status drug where the, the expense almost seems to be a large part of the attraction. What is the attraction of something like cocaine? Well, to do cocaine is to make a statement. It's like flying to Paris for breakfast. It's that has a familiar ring to it. A, a quotation <laughs> quote from, from the, the book. book. Right. It, uh, it's a profoundly reinforcing drug. You feel invincible. Uh, your mind is clear. You can uh, work for 12 to 18 hours a day without feeling any fatigue. It kills your appetite. I don't want to sound like a commercial. It clears You're your sinuses. You're doing a pretty good job. <laughs> uh, it's not everything that, you know, we, we just don't have to believe everything that everybody tells us. And uh, for myself, when I went into this, I, I, I just got completely bored with the New York life. And this was during the Nixon years when I went into it. And I was opposed to the uh, war in Vietnam. And uh, I didn't feel like paying taxes. And I think in a way I was making a statement. And at the same time, I'm, in, I'm smuggling, I'm on jury duty, I'm collecting for multiple sclerosis, I'm behaving like a absolutely, completely normal citizens with normal concerns, I'm marching up Broadway in peace parades. Uh, we're smoke, coke smugglers are like anybody else. We, we bleed just like everybody else, except that we have more of a chance to prove it. <laughs> Unquestionably. Not one of the calmer businesses. Since you describe a drug that is reasonably mild, the effects from your report, certainly from Sigmund Freud's reports, seem primarily beneficial. Why do you see this opposition? Why is it listed as a, dr a dangerous drug? Or why do, why do you think it is listed and, and actively pursued as a dangerous narcotic? Well, I think it was the... Halstead Act in 19, around 1914. You know, cocaine used to be in just about every patent medicine. It was in Coca-Cola uh, prior to 1904. And uh, the MA, the American Medical Association, just didn't have it in the con under control. This marvelous feel-good drug. Here, take your Pennsylvania farmer in the morning. He gets up, he takes his, elica, his elixir, his swig of cocaine, gives some to his horse, and goes out and plows a field for 18 hours, and eats high as hell. And he's probably will lead a march on the uh, people smoking reefers. But this is what happened. And uh, the medical authorities just wanted to get something under their control, so they replaced it with speed. Uh, something that they could dispense, make everybody feel good, and ruin their insides. And Haida Asbury, uh, back in the 60s, they were cutting, doing autopsies on 17, 18-year-old kids that had the insides of an 80-year-old man, all from speed, mm -hmm. which the doctors are still dispensing. We've got every fat, middle-aged housewife in the United States speeding, and, the, and they're worrying about their kids in the cellar smoking marijuana, which is relatively harmless. You say relatively harmless. You're a little bit milder about marijuana than about cocaine. Well, I think uh, cocaine is definitely, I mean, it, it's certainly all the evidence isn't in. I mean, I don't want to paint a, a picture. Uh, I'm sure that, that when you stack it up with uh, alcohol and cigarettes, it's going to be less harmful. But we haven't had the long-range use of marijuana and cocaine, and studies are still being done. And Bickett Harvard and Grimspoon, no, Bickett Yale and Grimspoon at Harvard, working under government grants, studying cocaine, have been going around the country, testifying at cocaine trials and getting people off. The famous Elwood McKinney case in Boston, 1976, where the judge just threw it out of court, and he says, I'm not going to throw anybody in jail for a mild stimulant, which was a landmark decision. Mm -hmm. And also what was a surprise to me, which is something of my na naivete, apparently cocaine is related to Novocaine, or procaine. The, the main That's how you got it. It's most famous for its anesthetic uh, qualities. You got into the cocaine trade having your initial experience in smuggling was with pot. Right. With, with marijuana. Uh, 
the attraction, according to, again, to, again to the book, was the, the business structure, if you will, the profit structure of cocaine. And the size of the load. Here you had one little loaf of bread that's worth uh, 200 loaves of bread if you were smuggling marijuana. So it was easier to move it. Now, the way I got into it, I read uh, Nixon's chief customs inspector, Miles Ambrose, wrote an article in the New York Times where he stated how a man got on a plane, went to South America, what he paid, how he brought it back, how he distributed, and how much money he made. I clipped out that article, and I'm, I must know 10 of my friends <laughs> that I pass around and say, well, this is for us, look. <laughs> it's a piece of cake. If the business is so simple, and again, from your descriptions, the supply is readily available, the techniques, if not simple, certainly, available. Mm -hmm. Why that elaborate price structure? Why that extra why is it why is cocaine so extraordinarily expensive? Why isn't it all over the place? Well, they keep it that way. The the uh, most of your smuggling now is being done really, you know, by organized crime and by all the uh, uh, government official officials in Colombia are all in on it, and it helps them with their balance of payment, and the same with uh, marijuana. They have one state in the northern part of Colombia, I forget the name, uh, that you just can't go, you can't go in it. No tourists can go in it, and that's where all the boats and planes leave from. It's, it's just for smuggling, that one state. Essentially a full-scale commercial operation. Right. The chief of police of the DAS of Colombia was arrested. Uh, he had his own setup. He had it laminated into uh, tabletops and things like that. And uh, the poor DA really can't stop it. There's just, you know, too much coming in and too much pressure. The same way with uh, we can't stop uh, cigarettes and alcohol again because it's too, too much money for the United States in taxes. I can't think of any other reason why they're selling these poisons. What about the, the distribution system for cocaine? You, you say that it's more readily available today than it was even when you were, were active. How does a commodity like this, a, a product, if you will, get distributed? Is it a fairly elaborate structure? Still, is Very carefully <laughs> and at night. Uh, each, you have no trouble finding customers. Uh, there's... It's simple. The smuggler comes in, he'll drop it off to a main dealer, and the main dealer will step on it. That means add some menite, uh, which, is borax. The, which is the finest cut. Borax I used only because I couldn't get menite at the time. Uh -huh. and, uh, and it was very heavy. Consequently, you could just put a few grams of this heavy thing, but it looked like the guy would pick it up and say, gee, it looks like a small ounce, and I'd say, weigh it. But he was getting a good product because there was just a little bit of borax in it. So it, it's brought in, in in bulk and then cut and redistributed. Right. And everybody who touches it steps on it or cuts it again. So finally you get to the street, you're getting 30%. At 30% still an effective drug? or All you have to do is four lines instead of one. And then you have 120 proof, like an alcohol label. Well, that's one way to... I hadn't thought of that. <laughs> okay. Pure stuff still available? or you see, It seems yeah. to be your preference. You spoke very highly of quality as an important consideration. Well, the best I ever got was 92%. And uh, it was so good, I had that stolen from me. <laughs> you meet nasty people in this business, really do. You talk about this article in the Times by Nixon's chief customer right. official, almost as if it was a blueprint for you of the, the cocaine. It right? gave me the idea. I'm, I doubt if I would have had the idea if I hadn't read that. Yeah. I had exactly the same reaction to your book, <laughs> that it made an extraordinarily detailed how-to-do-it manual well, I wouldn't. for the smuggler. I, I, I'd hate to think that anybody would you know, get in trouble from reading the book and do it. And I'd like to say here and now things have changed since the book. Uh, it would really grieve me terribly if somebody tried to follow one of the things, although it would probably work. We're going to say, <laughs> to from reading your it. descriptions of them, I couldn't see what could possibly go wrong with them. They sounded 
virtually foolproof. Applying the same principles that I applied in the book, uh, I could have you walking out of a bank with $10,000 in your pocket, and if you got stopped, they couldn't do a thing to you because I'd build it up with paperwork, which is the same way I ran all the other. Yeah, not, not only were your plans elaborate in terms of protection in case something did go wrong, but they seemed extraordinarily elaborate and well-designed to prevent anything from going wrong. Mm. Custom-built wooden statues filled and, and re-cemented <laughs> in ways that were virtually indetectable. Uh, some of your suitcase techniques. Uh, there we are, back to packaging again. I'm a, I'm a packaging <laughs> man. <laughs> Apparently a very, very good one. <laughs> it's, it's still a pharmaceuticals packager. Well, I was also very lucky, and uh, I, in fact, I thank my arrest. I think my arrest is what saved my life if I kept going. Uh, I just had too many close calls, and some, something would have happened to me. Well, you That's do describe sure. one of your associates, associates in quotes, who does not survive the book. Yeah, rainy day. That was too bad. Uh, when I say that was too bad, I don't mean to be flip about it. Uh, but I told him that uh, the price he was offered for that was just too high, and he should have been more careful. That's a heck of a thing to say. Uh, I was in New York last week, and uh, I met a, uh, a fellow uh, that read about Manit in the uh, in the book. And he went over to Italy, and he signed up for it, uh, got an exclusive dis distribution rights. And he called me up to do a promotion and to endorse the product and everything in paraphernalia magazines, etc. And uh, he was a smuggler, and he was the last one left, the only one left living out of six when he started. But he's also got a 90-foot yacht and four apartment houses and <laughs> stuff like that. And now he's got a legitimate business, seeing still all the same people and having a wonderful time. He's uh, spending $30,000 a month on advertising. The paraphernalia business is now a $350 million business in the United States and growing. The drug paraphernalia. Right. And they're going to bring out a Zachary Swan line in just about every item going. Who's designing the packaging for it? Zachary Swan. How about it? Okay. <laughs> this is a side of the business that really doesn't come through. You talk about danger, but there's no real feeling of danger in the book, except for Rainy Day. You don't feel it, and that's back to the reinforcement of the cocaine. Um, you, do, you feel invincible. To be a cocaine smuggler, you have to be two things smart enough to get away with it and dumb enough to try it. Rare combination. Or lucky enough to be forced out of it. Well, that's, that's how you survive, because uh, I didn't end up with any of the money. You know, it all went to the winds. Uh, spend $10,000 to rent a house for the summer, you know, in, uh, out in Long Island. Bought a Porsche for my dogs to eat. Well, Anybody that. that got busted, they knew where to come, you know, for bail money and things like that. So you just, the money goes. But I must admit I had a heck of a good time. How about now? Do you miss having the money first? No. Now I'm married. I married Alice in the book. And I have a three-year-old boy and a one-year-old boy. And uh, Oh, the one-year-old boy wasn't in the book. <laughs> That's no. more recent. <laughs> and... Um, I'm very happy, and I'm really into the children. I'm raising organic vegetables. My son hasn't had one chemical, including candy, sugar, salt, or anything, so I've done a 180-degree turn on that. Right. From deliberately inducing chemicals to <laughs> avoiding all of them. A gentleman of extremes. How about the excitement? It sounded like a, a life that, that you really did enjoy, whether the, whether the influence of the cocaine or... The life itself. I do miss the excitement. Uh, Pennsylvania isn't noted for its uh, wild times and, and a <laughs> lot of excitement. <laughs> but, you know, when you go on tour with the book and you do Good Morning America and you travel all over and you have a lot of fun, uh, there's excitement in that. And then there'll be another book and then the movie and who knows. 
if it's not getting too personal, how about that side of it? Has the the financial aspects of the book and the movie and now a, a second and possibly third book planned, has that in any way compensated for the loss of income from the, the cocaine itself? Yeah, but right right today I'm even. Uh, I've been paying, I just finished my 1970 taxes. It took me three years to pay off 1969, and uh, now I'll go into 71. Uh, but I'm making good payments, and next month I'll get a nice check for the movie, <laughs> and I slowly clear all that away. So the government is after you for back taxes for your income while in the cocaine Right, business. whatever they can see went into a checking account, etc. Hey, I better watch myself. <laughs> Well, the, all those, those visible symptoms of wealth and the, your lifestyle that you described you was see fairly the car. visible. I'm, dr I'm driving a big old battered white van, and uh, I, I don't need much, you know, to be happy. I can only eat one steak a night and have one bottle of wine. I don't have to have twenty of them lined up. You don't do coke anymore, apparently. Uh, I'll put it to you this way: it's too expensive. But if somebody puts it right in front of me, I wouldn't turn my nose up at it. Any other drugs that... I'll do marijuana. Mm -hmm. And uh, I gave up martinis. And I am addicted to cigarettes. And a bottle of wine. Which I'm really fighting. But combined with the organic farming. That's, I, I still see that as a, as a strange combination in attitudes. Perhaps the same combination that is... I'm Smart probably, enough to get away with it and dumb enough I'm to I'm probably it. the only one that harvests kohlrabi with a cigarette in his mouth. <laughs> <laughs> you say that it, it's certainly nothing you would do again, and you, you express great relief that you survived. Right, I, I, and I certainly... Ne well, just the thought of being locked away from my children is enough of a deterrent, deterrent. What if cocaine became legalized? Could you see becoming involved in the, in the business again? No. As a, as a legal activity. No. Mm -mm. Uh, like I said before, all the evidence isn't in. And I'm sure that sooner or later they're going to find something wrong with it. If they search long enough. I mean, you can go into anaphylactic uh, shock if you're allergic to it. Like, for instance, penicillin. It's oh, the same, sure. would be the same thing. Uh, the happiest and the greatest way to live, of course, is not to have anything. But we live in a stressful society, and people do take things, and you can't stop them. Uh, so I wouldn't want to be part of, you know, introducing, you know, strange substances into people. What about anyway. neighbors and, uh, and and other people who you meet who are introduced to you and said, you know, here's this man who's this great international coke smuggler. How do they strangely, react? Strangely enough, uh, uh, of course, I was worried about this, you know, moving in with my family and the boys will be going to school next year and everything. Uh, everybody has just been absolutely, completely wonderful. Uh, I've, they knew I paid my debt uh, to society and they know I'm not doing anything. And... Uh, I'm actually treated as a celebrity, you know. Uh, we have a poor sense of values here. Uh, well, in, in your case, I don't find it at all strange. You're a de delightful person. This has been a very delightful evening, Mr. Zachary Swan. Thank you for joining us on These Are the Times. <laughs>